Joe Church, if you're a guest. Oh, look, all sorts of new faces. If you're new to this church, welcome. Uh, if you've come before, this will be familiar. We're going to be doing a couple celebrations that are annual for us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we have a couple of quick announcements, so let's do those. Hi, I'm Lucy Spaglose, I'm the head deacon, and we will be welcoming new members on June 2nd. Could the deacons please stand up? So, uh, if you're interested in joining the church, you could speak to me or any of the people standing here, or Lisa, and take a red folder from the back of the church. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Connie Green. I'm the vice chair of the pastor search committee. I love being the vice of something in the church. <laughs> We're holding focus groups starting this week to gather your visions for the Guilford Community Church to help us give an accurate portrayal of our church for the profile. The profile is a document posted on the UCC website for prospective pastors. We hope everyone will sign up for one meeting. They'll last about an hour, and each group will be asked the same questions. Some meetings are at the church, and some are at people's homes. This week, you could come to my house on Tuesday at 7, the church Wednesday at 1, sat church, at the church Saturday at 10 a.m. with donuts and coffee, next Sunday afternoon at the Davises at 4, We'll have sign-up sheets downstairs during coffee hour, and after that, you can call the church office and sign up with Patty. If you really, really, really dislike talking in a group, you can write your responses to the same questions on a form we'll have downstairs. I encourage you to attend one of the groups. It gives you the opportunity to hear what other people are thinking, and it may spark you to think about things that you hadn't before. And if you need a ride, we can arrange a ride. You just have to let us know. Please pray for us and with us for guidance from the Holy Spirit as we do this important work. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Christie, and I'm the head of our planned giving effort. And on next Sunday, right after coffee hour at 11.30, Anna Saavedra, is that how you pronounce it, Nancy? <coughs> is coming from Edward Jones. She's on Nancy's board at Youth Services and will help us learn a little bit about wills and tax considerations and options for giving as you plan um, for your own resources as you leave this life. And also um, Jim McCauley, our own Jim McCauley, who does this professionally will give us a little introduction to advanced medical directives. So please plan to stay after church next Sunday. I'm Nancy Leach, co-chair of the pie sale that's coming up um, on our holiday weekend. And I just wanted to remind people that there's sign-ups in the back and down at coffee hour, both for ingredients donations and also for signing up to help for a couple hours. Thursday evening, the 23rd of May, Friday all day, we're gonna have uh, different teams and you can come for um, a couple hours or come for many more. Um, Saturday, we're selling the pies. Hope you'll buy some pies then and um, we can use people uh, doing the selling too. So come out, it's a fun event to be part of. Days. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, maybe I'll start here. Your curtsy. So Judy's turning ten. Did you hear that? And she's here. Uh, Evan. Uh, Evan. Uh, this uh, Thursday, my brother and great so my brother and his uh, sister-in-law's birthday is Thursday. The 20, uh, 16 is my sister brother and brother's birthday. Sister-in-law and brother's birthday on the same day. Yeah. On Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Thanks. Okay, Riley. Um, I just want 
turns 12 on May 2nd. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so you're here and, present. And my granny tur uh, turns me, um, I mean, uh, my granny's birthday. Um, We're not talking uh, about how old you're going to be. The 15th. The 15th. So yours was the second, and Grammy's is the 15th. Okay. Yes, Krista. My husband's 82nd birthday. Ah, John, 82 this week. There's a whole row here, you guys. Um, yes, sure. My, my parents, Marilyn and Betty Spiller, Wait, 65th wedding anniversary is this Wednesday. Oh, congratulations. Wow. 65 years of wedded bliss, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got myself going. Jill? <laughs> right. yeah. Tuesday is Tammy's birthday. Oh, Tammy. Oh, okay. we have all sorts of people. Yes, Ben. Your uncle Doug on the 15th, okay. Yes, Kristen. Oh, God. My mother's birthday is tomorrow. And she will be 96. Her mother will be 96. Yeah. I wanted to also, when we're singing, it's not really a birthday, but did you notice the red tulips out front? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know how many of you were here, but we planted tulips um, in memory of, basically, of, of Nancy Miller and of Judith Kinley and of Mother Linda King, uh, and they're all blooming for Mother's Day, which I think is really wonderful. So we're thinking especially of them, mothers to the church. All right, let's sing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> happy birthday, happy birthday, we love you. Happy birthday, and may all your dreams come true. When you
see that Lily and Margaret have arrived, so if they could come toward the front and. Um, uh, uh, sure, we could have Siri. Choir, could you just stay up? Sorry, it's a little late. But. And then Larry, if you could come up. And I'll give you the. We have late breaking news today, not in the bulletin. So I think most of you know, well, first of all, I'm Larry Crockett. And uh, I think most of you know that my late wife, Shirley, was the pastor here from Easter Sunday of 1976 until November of 1997. And uh, she started out with a congregation that was pretty small, maybe 10, 15 people. And the church grew and grew and grew, and it finally grew to the point where we had to move it and enlarge it to accommodate the congregation in the Sunday school. And then we retired in November of 97, and then very sadly, just six months after our retirement, Shirley had a stroke and then a cerebral hemorrhage, and we lost her as we were visiting our daughter in Arkansas in May of 1998. So in her honor and memory, we established a Shirley Crockett, Shirley Harris Crockett Award, which we give annually. And it can go to a young person, it can go to an adult. It recognizes uh, various qualities of people that are involved in the church. Uh, in many cases, it helps uh, someone do something. Uh, that they wouldn't be otherwise able to do. Uh, and that's the case this time. It's going to support these two lovely young women who are going to be youth delegates to the United Church of Christ Synod meeting this summer. And where is that meeting? Milwaukee. So, it's my pleasure to give a certificate uh, to each of these young women, and then they will, I presume, get a check at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so this just reads, this certifies that Lily Quintero or Margaret Holland was granted the Shirley Harris Crockett Award on Sunday, May 12, 2019, to support her being a delegate to the UCC Senate 2019. So, delegates to the National Synod before, so this is a first, and I think Shirley would be really happy from what I can imagine. So we're going to sing the song most of you know uh, that Tony wrote, and Tony will help us sing in honor of Shirley. on a church first, on a church birthday uh, downstairs. That was the firehouse. Oh, was it in the firehouse? Fire yes. Oh, you're right. Thank you for your memory. And after Shirley heard it, she said, oh, someone be listen to my sermons. <laughs> Man, once to ourselves. Lonely. 
could find the back of the insert, uh, we have a unison preparation for confession. Let us pray. Creator God, we have neglected our neighbors in their times of need. We have enjoyed profits and pleasures that harm your land and pollute your waters. We have squandered much of what you have made and called good. Have mercy on us. Help us change our ways and make us new, that all may know the joy of abundant life. Amen. Let's pause now and sit silence together in contemplation and confession. grace upon grace. In Jesus Christ, God shows and tells an endless love that inspires green shoots of a new life. We are forgiven. children, please come forward. Or young people, that's also helpful. know this is technology. <laughs> this is what people used to call technology. Well, what do you see on there? What's that? A picture of? Oh, oops, I lost the picture. Oh, there it is. What's the picture of? It's the earth. And it's 1031. <laughs> <laughs> the earth. This is also technology, they say. <laughs> all right, so if you kids know this, you can all join in. It's very participatory. <laughs> the earth is our mother. We must take care of her. The earth is our mother. We must take care of her. We 
must take care of her. The earth is our mother. We must take care of her. of someone else who came to the church. Kenya to start learning how to what? Did I forget something? 
And so she's now doing something on her own. So, but I wanted to have you just tell about these three little girls. Do you all want to look at this picture? All right, so these three little girls, one's five, one's six, one's seven. They're all part of a house of 11 people. Um, they have a mom, no dad, um, and I was walking by on the streets of Ecuador, and I saw their house, and their house was missing part of its floor. So when I saw this, I went and I talked to them. I saw these little three girls, and they were playing with sticks. And they said, we really want a Barbie doll. Can anyone bring me a Barbie doll? And I said, yeah, maybe you can bring me a Barbie doll the next time I see you. So we were able to build a house for them. So they have a new bamboo house in Ecuador with a new floor. And what about the Barbie doll? And yes, they have, they have three little Barbie dolls as well. Now. So just because Tilda noticed these three little girls, now they have a house. Isn't that pretty amazing? Yeah. So, and they have what? If there are 11 in the house and there's no dad, then let's do the math. So there's a mom and three girls. So how many other brothers and sisters are there? Come on. Six. Seven. All right. Jenny, one. So six other brothers and sisters in this house. And do they all have a bed? Or do they just sleep on the floor? Or what do they do? Um, well, they have a bed now. They have a bed. They have a bed now. So somehow in this house, they can put 11 beds. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, children, for your work. So let's pray for children and for the, what, you, what are the names? You know, remember the names of little girls? No. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you have touched children's heart to go and do this work so far away from all of us, and we thank you and ask a blessing for this family who now has a house that has a floor and a roof and beds and even toys for the children to play with. We ask that you bless this family and that you bless Tilda with strength so that she can carry on her important work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So there's a hymn wherever you may wander, and we're singing this for Tilda and for the children who go downstairs. Thank you.
From me all things proceed, and unto me all things must return. Let my worship be within the heart that rejoices, for behold, all acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. Let there be beauty and strength, power and compassion, honor and humility, mirth and reverence within you. And you who seek, seek to know me, know that you are seeking and yearning will avail thee, not unless you know the mystery. If that which you seek thou find not within yourself, you will never find it without. For behold, I have been with you from the beginning, and I am that which is attained at the end of desire. The scripture today is from Genesis 21, verses 1 through 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him, and when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him, and God commanded him, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on his shoulders and then set her off with a boy. She went on her way and wandered through the desert of Beersheba and when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down by a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from the heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy's crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his Mother got a wife for him from Egypt. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. Blessed Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations 
of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I have to say, I think I bit off more than I can chew today. I wanted to talk to you about Hagar and Sarah, the mothers of um, Christian and Jewish faith and of Muslim Islam. Today, this week is Ramadan. Not this week, but for 40 days, but it began at the beginning of this week. And because I happened to be in a situation where I was with our um, Muslim brother, Omar Latif, and he was in his first day of fasting, I thought, well, the least I can do is to dive a little bit into Islam and see how it relates to us. And of course, because I'm fascinated with the women of the Bible, I decided who better than Hagar and Sarah to take us on that journey. It's a pretty tough journey, though. Um, a lot of people have come to me over the years saying, well, I decided to read the Bible and I could barely stomach the Old Testament. You know, it's really tough um, to read some of these stories, and this story is like that. Um, there are two women who, for all intents and purposes, shared a husband. Um, they both came from pretty regal backgrounds. Sarah was a beautiful woman and was married, it was given to Abraham as an honor. The Pharaoh, according to some literature, Hagar was actually Pharaoh's daughter. And he, had, he gave her to Abraham as a gift. So it wasn't as if when we say slave, we're talking about someone of a lower class. It was actually, she was actually a second wife. Uh, so that's an important part of the story as we hear it. Um, just to go briefly over the story that you've just heard, Hagar is actually cast out twice. One time by Sarah just uh, because she is so fed up with this beautiful young woman who's now pregnant with her husband's son. And she's so upset that she casts Hagar out. And Hagar is pregnant in the desert with nothing to do. And an angel comes and encourages her to go back, to persist and continue in what's a very difficult situation. Then we hear today that it happens again. Now this is after Sarah has had this very unexpected baby. She was aged. I, they say she was in her 90s. I think in our day and age, someone translated it to being 46. So I don't know. I can look at Larry and ask him what he thinks. But nonetheless, an age that is older than most women would expect to conceive a child. There are a lot of stories about her and how they, she proved that it was her baby. It's, it's a, there's a lot of Jewish midrash, so they pick her up as well. So there, here are these two women, uh, and both need the encouragement of angels. And the angels come in different forms, um, some directly. The angel um, basically saves Sarah from uh, Pharaoh. Um, she, or not Pharaoh, but in, uh, in another household that she's given over, and the angels kind of nudge the man who would take her as a second wife aside, so she kind of saves her from misuse from men. Hagar is visited twice in the desert, and Hagar goes on, and for those of you who don't know, after this story of finding the water, um, she does this, in the, in the, in the discovery of the water, she, she runs back and forth seven times to what's now Mecca. And that running back seven times before she finds the well is now what people who would go to Mecca do. They run back, they run around the Kaaba seven times. And that's in honor of Hagar. So here we have, in the midst of Islam, this very important religion, a woman who really established the core ritual for finding faith and finding what we need. She came, she was a person from a minority, and yet she became something quite important. So here we have today all kinds of, two kinds of mothers. They're mad at each other, they're jealous of each other, one is terrible to the other, one cares for the other. 
It's sort of a very true and terrible story of what mothers can be. So I wanted to, the image that I wanted to give you, and I'm not sure if this is helpful or not, is that this morning as I was trying to make meaning for you, I decided to um, go start getting ready for coming. And I realized that my um, soap, there was a nice big piece of soap, and then there was a little teeny piece of soap. I don't know if you ever have that, where you kind of want them to stick together. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm the generation where you don't waste soap. And so I was trying to get them to stick together. And just as I was thinking of that, this little crumb of a soap and this bigger one, all of a sudden it opened me to so many memories of soap. And my primary memory, besides my grandmother telling me not to waste the soap, and I want to get you to tell me some soap memories, was of uh, Uganda when I was working there and I had a very small child and they had just had a terrible genocide. There were very few men left, so the women in the village needed to um, try to remember how to do some of the things they'd done before. And one was to make soap. Now, how many of you know what goes into soap? Anybody know? Okay. Oh. Fat and lye. Fat and lye. So, in the context of Uganda, this is in a village, where would you get fat? Animals. So, sheep fat. So, one of the things that I never knew is that sheep originally have very fat tails. So, you can actually excuse me for being sort of biblical, but you can cut off the tail of a sheep and the sheep is still okay and you get quite a bit of fat. So they were able to get fat. And then where would you get lime? Yeah. Ash. So out of the ashes and out of the animal, you put them together and what more thing do you need? Heat and water. Yeah, heat and water. So the heat. So it's our sort of out of the ashes and out of the oil with the heat of love comes the soap. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And then you have soap to wash things. Does anybody else have a kind of grandmotherly or some kind of, now of course here, in this day and age, what else do we put in besides? Fragrance. Fragrance, right. And the fragrance from flowers or something like that. Yes. My, my children, years ago, Wait, 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 wait. Ask me. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. My, my children, maybe 50 years ago, asked me, 35 years ago, said, Mom, did you make soap in the backyard when you were, <laughs> when you were young? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I think of the mother. <laughs> we hadn't made soap. <laughs> Anybody else have a certain <laughs> My grandmother also didn't want to waste soap, and she felt like when soap sat in a pool of water, like it does in a soap dish, it was just disintegrating. So she used to hang a magnet in the shower and by the sink and put a tack in the head of every bar of soap, and you had to hang it. Did anyone else do that? <laughs> okay, there it comes. <laughs> so my grandmother actually made soap, and um, my mother tried, but uh, that's her so. Uh, she decided that she better go get it from the store. But I was taught not to waste soap, and it's, I've passed it on. If honey was here now, or John Michael, it drives me wacky. You have the soap dish, you know, the ones that you cover, and they there's water. They just leave it open and the water gets in there and I say, it's all going down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely, really. Yeah. 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 My grandmother also uh, is crocheting each of us kids a little turtle that was about the size of a bar of soap, and it was all, you know, open lacy. And the neck opened up, and, and you could put all your slivers of soap in there, uh, and then the crochet part, like yeah. a little loofah kind of thing, so you could wash your scalp yeah. with this little turtle. She made a poem about it. Um, I just a little turtle with nothing much to do. So I filled myself with soap and crawled right up to you. You can let me on your tummy and on your hands and feet. 
and all around your neck and arms no, like you'll get your seat. <laughs> did the same thing except not in the shape of a frog. It was just a bag hanging there. And oh my goodness, it was a mortal sin in our family to waste that so to take it outside and play with it. Oh, I did that one time. Got my bottom tan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, during the war, my grandmother also made soap, and I still have it, and I still use it. It's called Grandma's Lye Soap, yeah. and I have probably almost a cubic foot of it, and I chop off a piece, use it down the front. <laughs> this stuff is great, and it cleans better than the stuff you buy at the store. <laughs> <laughs> a really interesting uh, Mary wanted to say something else. They, they, you could buy a, a metal thing that with a, you know, that opened them shut. Yeah. Put your bits of soap in it and flush that to wash your dishes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With, the, with the bits of soap, you put to make the dishwasher soapy with the bits of whatever soap you have. That was during the war. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that. Yeah. I lost all these stories. Do you have a silk story? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was at family's post or someplace, and I, we didn't go and buy soap, but someone did. And we, we decided that you can uh, find some felt, and you wet the soap, and then you wrap the felt in the soap. Yeah. yeah. And we wash our hands, the soap goes through the film. Okay. Yeah. So as I, you know, as I looked back on Uganda and realizing that after this war, what it was to have soap again, you know, when you, to be able to take ashes and to take something at hand and to create something that you could wash your entire body with, and I felt like for some reason to have that be the first thing we paid attention to after the war, yeah. seems so important. Um, and I think, I, I, I hear all of you, I just appreciate all these stories as we start thinking of the trials of people and how they made their soap and all the women through the years bathing their babies and their families and uh, in all kinds of situations. Um, I think of Tilden, um, just walking down the street, you know, there's a story in Genesis, right, that we're talking about how the angels come to visit Abraham and Sarah. And I wonder if those children will think back and think that maybe an angel visited them and brought them a house, you know. So just the work of God that takes so many forms, sometimes as simple as putting two things together that you would never think of, sometimes people coming unexpectedly into our lives. I'd encourage you to forgive all the women who've been nasty to each other for different reasons and to be compassionate for women who suffer so. All these women are wrapped together uh, in this world of trial and yet it's such a beautiful world as well. So that's not a great sermon, but I think it does bring, um, <laughs> bring us to the truth of mothers, and I hope you got a little taste of Hagar. I'd like to really encourage you um, to think of the women, the Muslim women who are going without food, but who have to get up. If the men get up to eat, at 4.30 in the morning so that they can make their fast. And what time do the women need to get up <laughs> early enough? And then they have to stay up later too. So let's pray. Let's pray for mothers in lavish households whose children are far away, engaged in lives of their own. For women without children who by choice or tragic circumstance cringe today as others celebrate for women with children who struggle to make ends meet, to do what they can, 
and women beyond struggling whose lives have fallen apart because of tragedy. Help us each be compassionate toward e towards each other, no matter how we perceive the other. Help us remember and listen for the angels that might help us walk through our next trial. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. that he sang with Mary Kay Brass and the River Singers this season. It's from Bosnia. It's a Islamic prayer. The text says, The peace of God be with you. My heart is sad that it wasn't fortunate to be by your side, Muhammad. You are the mercy of the merciful one. You are the joy of my heart and the medicine for my wounds. My soul is cured when you give a blessing.
<laughs> Pray for other people, Mother's Day. Holy One, we gather in your presence to give you thanks and to celebrate the gift of your love, a love that supports, nurtures, and challenges us in ways that strengthen and transform us. We offer you praise and thanksgiving for you unfailing presence in our lives and all of the blessings that you so gently offer us. Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, we give thanks for mothers the world over. We give thanks for all those who have nurtured and cared for us. We remember especially birth mothers, adoptive mothers, surrogate mothers, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, neighbors, and all women who have shared their faith with us. We pray, compassionate God, for those mothers who have been hurt, disillusioned, or disappointed in their role as mother. We pray for those who have been denied a longed for chance at new motherhood. And for those whose years of mothering have been cut short by the loss of a child. We lift up before you, O oh God, the members of our human family around the world. For those who are afflicted, or suffering at this time. For those who need healing. For those who require bread or shelter. For those who live in violent homes and communities. For those who are grieving. And for those who need I know to you alone. We remember Shirley Crockett and Marion Hoden, Peg Hunter and Ella Pega, Paula Richardson and Grace Blum, Judith Kingley and Nancy Miller, and the women who nursed this hurts. Holy Mother and Father of us all, touch us with your healing peace and gentle embrace that we may walk in your ways, bringing dignity, justice, and peace to all corners of your world. All this we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you. 